Okay, our story is um, we've farmed it in Burring Bar catchment for. Oh, my grandfather moved there in the 19, 16, 17, I suppose. So they farmed on a little farm beside Mobile, and then 1906 ish, Dad and his brother moved on to the Burring Bar farm, which is much more suited to dairying. It's got good water on both sides of the property. It's uh, dissected by Tweed Valley Way and the rail corridor, which is is not a good thing for a dairy, but it's probably a good thing for a cheese factory because it's accessible, it's in the village. Um, so going back when I started, when I left school, everything was, you were, you were cropped for your winter fodder for your cows. So that was uh, cow cane, um, all rye grasses and oats were cultivated. It was a lot of work, it was too much. And we've come to a system now where we concentrate on our permanent summer grasses and then just over sow in, um, in autumn. And our, our winter pastures come through that, um, that swathe of, of uh, Kaikia and Soteria. And it, we've been doing it for years now and I'm, it's built um, permanent pasture on our country that we just... Sup and, these tropical areas, they have, we have two growing seasons. So our winter pasture, we have to plant every year, but we get great um, production by having two growing seasons. The winter um, pasture grows through the, obviously, autumn, winter into spring, depending on how harsh our spring is. Um, and then We've gone away from any cultivation, and that, that cover in our country has, has helped us in that it's not nearly as vulnerable to um, a drought condition. We've got slides there that we'll, we'll bring up that um, will show we can go from a drought to having excess feed in a month as soon as we get rain. Um, right. yeah. Part of our strategy over the years, and it's more been brought on with deregulation in the dairy industry, it became about how we manage a, um, and in 20 years, milk margins on milk have declined. And even more so now, prices have come up, but it's nothing that would um, help a farm. Well, it helps, but it doesn't adequately compensate for what we've got to cope with. Like there's, there's farms I know they're spending 10, 20 grand a week on feed, and that's just to keep the dairy herd um, ticking away so that when things come good, they'll start making money. But you've got to have seriously deep pockets to, um, to manage that and mental fortitude too. Like there's, yeah, there's some farms that are really, they're still positive about staying in the industry for their, um, for their family, but probably for themselves they should walk away from it. But they've got kids involved and they're keen, so that's the next generation. The margins in dairy have, mean, have meant um, scale of pr production, but we've really diversified. So we're running, in the 2017 flood cyclone Debbie, we were running a herd that um, 120 head, and that was helping us fund the establishment of our cheese factory. So, which our direction has been to diversify, and um, that 2017 flood was um, a metre higher than anything we'd seen before. Um, so, the height of the cheese factory flooded which we never expected. That was just, just blew us, well, blew me away because I'd never seen it. So it, um, that's some of the pasture, that's where the cows are grazing now. That even though it was such a hard season, we were able to over sow as soon as we could get machines on paddocks. It's only a tractor and a spreader, throw it on. We hadn't put any fertiliser out for seven or eight months because it's been too wet. 
as soon as the season started to turn and we could start um, getting a bit of fur out. And that's only one application. Um, that, that's, the, that's, that's the feed they're going into now. That, that, that is really... Well, you get westerly winds, then you've got to start watering it. But by having a, um, a, um, a cover on your country, and it's the, the existing summer grass plus the rye grass comes through it, um, it, it pushes it out a lot longer that you, you have to irrigate. And then it means as soon as you get rain, you put fertiliser on and that fertiliser is protected under that, um, that layer of mulch. And um, we fertilise as soon as it rains and then sometimes it'll be two months before we come back. But so, where we live, it's going to rain. A lot of that, um, that's all, there's no irrigation there, that's just um, <coughs> unirrigated country with ryegrass thrown over the top of it. Um, that's the flood early in February, or late in February. Um, these are cows grazing that pasture that you saw earlier that was underwater. Um, the existing summer grass under there, it's got about this much flood mud on it and it's it's not at the state that I like it, but at least cows are getting feed off it. Um, regenerative grazing or cell grazing or rotational grazing, it's been around for a long, long time and it's, it's a key part of what we do. Um, this is in the middle of that, that wet time. The flood was one thing, but the weather we had um, with the flood was every bit as bad as the flood, maybe worse. Excessive wet is a lot harder to deal with um, with cattle than um, a dry time. Our, um, going back to when my father was involved, we've always left our steeper country to trees um, and managed our, um, our grassland as grassland. I, I much prefer to be a grazier than a cropper because I, I know how much difference that... Um, long-term cover on that country makes. This is some of the erosion um, up on our steeper country. If that was all clear, it'd be a quarry going through there. That, that's actually probably three or four metres deep, but it goes from the top of the hill all the way down the bottom. In the 70s, I can remember, there was similar sort of conditions, not as intense, the rainfall. It was, it was over a more prolonged period of time, but there were bananas and um, my parents were establishing tropical um, summer pastures and legume mixes. They were physically up there digging trenches along the side of hills and had two wheel tra drive tractors cutting contours around the side of these hills. That it was dead set dangerous, but that's what they had to do to keep that country where it was. And it, it, I will never go back to doing that again. And that's what they had to do to, at the time, but we've sort of gone a bit further away, well away from that. These are, um, we're currently, for the last, Sue in a former life was a nursery person, so we, um, over the last 30 years, we've um, always been, um, had interest planning up our riparian areas because they're always, uh, until you get native riparian species on your, on your creek banks, your creek banks won't be stable. Um, these, this is a current project. We've sort of, we were using, um, initially we started with um, barbed wire and then we've gone away from barbed wire to single strand um, electric. But now Gallagher have put out, um, I think it's a polycarbonate post that will fold to the ground and it's a lot stronger than a, a steel post with the clips. So we've put in copper's logs, they're a metre in the ground and then these flexible posts that actually move like a suspension fence. So we're thinking that will um, be a much better option in a flood area when we're planning out these riparian areas. So that's, that's an ongoing project. That'll go on forever, I think, for whoever's got the farm. Um, that was, I was talking about in a flood situation. This is, 
it's hard to remember, but in 2018, 2019, it was very dry. In a dairy situation, if you've got cattle that have to walk in that and through that in a hot summer, they'll just go and stand in it. Your mastitis issues are huge. So we've got a project now. Most of the country on the south side of Tweed Valley Way is water troughed. Um, the next project is on the north side of the farm. We'll put in a couple of big water troughs and a header tank and pump from a, a dam up to a header, header tank and keep the cattle out of that um, situation. Uh, that's Sue's wildlife photo of galah and a water trough. Um, this is um, ground cover on the north side of the farm. Um, that's probably December. Still, you know, even if you had to supplementary feed cattle there, you, they would still get feed value out of that. And bearing in mind too, um, our access to irrigation water, as soon as you cease to pump, um, comes in on your creek, well, that's when you normally use most of your irrigation water. So no one will irrigate as much as what they need to or what they're used to. Um, this is country at the back. That was before the drought, that's a month. That's in the drought, that's a month after. It respond uh, this is all to do with stocking rates too. Uh, we've sort of gone the other way from most dairies that are increasing stocking. <laughs> I want to slow down. Like I quite enjoy dairying. Dairying when it's, when things are operating, cows are walking out to good pasture, they're coming in, they want to get milk, they get a feed in the dairy and then they walk out again. It's, there's an order to it and it's quite enjoyable if you don't have to do it all the time. <laughs> um, part of our strategy was to put in hay sheds. That's in the middle of last year, I think. You get them, you've got to unload them when you get them. But it's a big part of how you manage is um, having the ability to take fodder when you need it. Last year, we ordered one, year, one load. The year before, it was four loads. This year, we've probably got away with going through the worst flooding we've ever had with um, 10 to 20 bales of hay. So um, We've also got a, not running a larger dairy, we've um, gone into a, for the last six years, into a speckle park breeding program that we run a small number of, um, of uh, beefies that's worked out quite well for us. And it means beef cattle aren't as um, needy as dairy cattle are for good um, fodder. They can, they, can, they can eat the scraps that the dairy cows don't want and um, still do quite well. Uh, part of the um, byproduct of the cheese factory is feeding whey, which they're drinking there. They love it and they do quite well on it. Uh, these are the <laughs> beef cross calves we're rearing that, to a speckle bull, uh, twins. Um, and now the cheese factory. Um, I'm quite, even though it's been a nightmare, but the cheese factory is why we're still farming because we can take a small proportion of what we produce. Most of it still goes to Norco, but um, the rest Sue does her stuff down there with the cheese factory. And I, I think we're farmers by, by trade to start with. We've got to learn how to better communicate what we're doing and, and market it. That's our next challenge. We've got it to there. We've got to take it further. Um, Tweed Valley Way. Um, another issue that I see the industry facing is um, rentals. Not being able to put a rental on farm for staff or family is just stupid. You know, like we will run out of energy before we run out of money. It, it's to keep us keen, there needs to be the ability to put more um, dwellings on farm. It's, um, it's been, you know, we've got these 40 hectare lot sizes locked up that you can't put in, only one dwelling on 40 hectares. We really need to be able to put, and seriously, it's not going to happen overnight. It'd take 10 years to use all the 40 hectare blocks around the place to put one extra dwelling. But it gives you the option of, um, having staff live and work on property um, 
it's something, you, it's a great place to live. I, if I didn't want to live here, I'd, I wouldn't be farming here. It's sort of, it's got so many options and you, we can attract people here by offering them the right conditions and incentives to come here. Um, I suppose the other thing I wanted to touch on was what Joe was talking about, how um, a properly managed grazing operation will build carbon in soils. Now, it's all about carbon sequestration, sequestration, is it? How do you, yeah. Um, but it builds fertility. The more fertile your country is, the more profitable it is. It, um, being sustainable is about being viable. You, the two go hand in hand. So, and it's got to have some opportunity for um, for the next generation to come through. So, I, I really believe um, good farming operations are an asset to a family and they're an asset to a community. That's about me, I think. Well,